swear it is the best rally I've ever been to. <laughs> steps of the Capitol on the first day of the session in 2014, a cold and rainy Tuesday morning that we called for a mass rally and at 10 o'clock it was raining and nobody was there. By, by noon when they when the legislature came together, we had a thousand people from around the state and 28 legislators came down the stairs to join us to excoriate Nikki Haley in the state of South Carolina for refusing to take our own tax money back to give a quarter of a million poor South Carolinians health care. That fight continues, um, but <laughs> the struggle continues in many fronts. Thank you, Dr. Green. All right. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I think in many ways, it's a reminder of why we are all here in the first place, uh, taking the Jessica Simpkins School of Human Rights. Of course, this evening is our final class of this semester. Uh, and I think as recent events in the news have shown, uh, the lessons of the Majestic School are more, uh, never more time than they are right now. You mentioned Nikki Haley, of course, now she's running for president of the United States. And according to her, when she was a child in the 1970s, everything was just fine. Everything was much simpler back then, both here in South Carolina and across the state, which would be news to, I think, the men and women in this room with us this evening. But uh, tonight, we're going to take a, a bit of a segue from talking about the history of this state and our country and tying it all together under the umbrella of, so what? Uh, in academia, as historians, we often ask each other the question, so what? When we're researching a topic or writing a book or what have you. But I think for citizens and activists who are involved with the Majesta School, the so what question is especially important. We've learned so much about the history of South Carolina the nation in which we live and the world in which we live. And the question becomes, what do you do with all this information? Uh, what kinds of programs and initiatives are available for you to get involved in uh, in order to help make this state a much better place? Now, there was a saying by a famous South Carolinian uh, centuries ago who once said that uh, South Carolina is too large, uh, too small of a republic, but too large to be an insane asylum. Hopefully, after taking the Majesta School, uh, we've all realized that while it is true we're too small to be a republic, we don't have to be an asylum either. We can instead be a place that actually genuinely cares about human rights, human dignity, and human freedom. And before we get into talking about some of the programs in which you can get involved in and some of the ideas that you may have in terms of uh, citizenship and involvement in South Carolina, I do have a very, very quick hopefully shameless plug. Uh, just today, I received a contributor's copy of a book to which I wrote a chapter for called uh, Forging Freedom and W.E.B. Du Bois's Twilight Years. Um, I'll post the link. Thank you. Right. To, to give you a sense of how academia works, uh, the first draft of the chapter was written back in 2018. So that was pre-pandemic. And I'm just getting a copy of it now. But the book is coming out in July, I'll put a link in the chat and make sure one's sent out at some point this week. But the book is actually quite relevant to our interest in this class. Um, it actually raises 
uh, significant questions about Du Bois's life um, and times. We tend to emphasize Du Bois in his earlier years and earlier career, but this book is about the last 30 years of his life, uh, when he is an avowed communist, uh, when he is really open in his radicalism. And in fact, my chapter is about the relationship between Dr. Du Bois and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you're probably thinking, when they had a relationship, well, keep in mind, Du Bois didn't pass away until 1963. And so he was alive long enough to observe and even critique um, some of Dr. King's ideas about civil disobedience and nonviolent protest, while at the same time providing some support for him. And as you may already know, Dr. King also spoke fondly about Du Bois. Uh, in fact, one of King's last major speeches in 1968 was a tribute to Dr. Du Bois on what would have been his 100th birthday. Um, again, I just put the link in the chat. I'll make sure to send it out to folks as well. And I think we may also arrange for my chapter to be sent out at some point too. So if you want to read that, you're more than welcome to. Okay, but enough about my own work. Let's get back to what we're really talking about this evening. Of course, you can see I'm wearing the uh, Majeska Simpkins t-shirt uh, for the Majeska Simpkins School of Human Rights. Uh, I made sure to wear it for two reasons. Number one, it's very hot. Um, so I wanted to wear something that was actually comfortable for one thing. But number two, I think the shirt really gets at what the school is all about. Uh, Ms. Simpkins herself was um, a knowledgeable reader and um, researcher of history. Uh, she knew many of the ideas and concepts we studied in this course. But for Ms. Simpkins, for Brett Bercy, for many others, it's not enough to simply know the history of South Carolina and the world. You also have to do something with that history. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. What have we been working towards this entire semester, which began back in March? What is it about the Majeska School that we hope you'll glean and learn from to become active citizens and active participants in the ongoing struggle for human rights and human dignity in South Carolina? So with that being said, uh, I want to turn the floor over to Brett and talk about some of the programs that we're, we're going to be um, talking about. And I'll also chime in with a few ideas as well in one program that is very near and dear to my heart as well. And keep in mind, as we discuss these programs, if you have any ideas for programs yourself, do not hesitate to offer those ideas tonight or down the road as well. One thing to keep in mind though, is that we will have um, by the end of class an ability to sign up for a program if you wish to do so either in the chat on Zoom or here in the classroom. Right, I'll tell you Great. You know, we certainly do not want to inhibit anyone's initiative to do whatever it is they want to do, but we want to offer you tools to do that whichever it is you pick better, more efficiently. And there's a sign-in sheet that Betty's going to pass around that has uh, put your name so we know you're here, and you can write there one of the, pro the projects that we're offering that are things that we've done literally over the decades that no one else has done. And that which it is, is gives us the, I think, the, hmm, the seriousness and the staying power that uh, we hope will be here uh, when your children are running the show. And that is actually being able to have a good idea, analyze a problem, pose a solution, write a law, pass a law, and make people do it. And so, we'll, I mean, looking firstly at, say, the Democracy 101 project, and that's D-E-M-O-C-R-A-S-C. Democracy uh, is a, um, it's been a, an introductory program we're going to polish up over July. Um, I, may, I need to mention that, that we had a, a sign from above today about our need to step back and, and re reorganize things. Uh, lightning hit the house and took out Becky's computer, which means that we can't communicate with you anymore until we do something about it. And so uh, this is an auspicious time in July for us to polish up some of the tools that we've had for some time now that uh, I mentioned just briefly with the beginning basis of the Democracy 101 project was following the money. Because if you don't know who who's where the money's coming from, you don't know whose interest it's serving. And this this is a society that's predicated on, on wealth and materialism. 
So when you pay for something, who generally owns it? The people that pay for it. And in South Carolina, uh, over 80% of the money that comes in that funds the 170 legislator, legislators and the um, uh, nine people we send to DC, that money comes from corporations, large corporations that generally aren't even based here. And they have agendas. And they're the ones that pay for the supposed democracy that we have. 16% comes out of the people's pocket that are the, the candidates. And maybe two or 3% on a good day comes from people that make donations like us. I mean, we may not make much donations, but most people don't. And so that um, we have a database that we helped build that is tied into where we can actually, you know, use that the type of follow the money stuff to explain uh, whose finger is on making certain decisions. So that the, the, we will give you, if you wanted to work on this program, we will give you a PowerPoint that you can be online. We can give it to you on a thumb drive. And a, and a teacher's guide that goes with it. So you could talk to your church club, school, civic organization, everybody that will put up with you and be able to talk about something that's relevant to them because you can tailor it to their neighborhood. And that the, uh, the idea uh, is that, that it could be shaped for the length. This class has gotten way too long. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've had 21 classes this year, counting the Sundays. And I think the first year we might've had eight or 10. And so we keep discovering new old history. It's fascinating once you start finding things that, that happen that nobody knows about and you really want to share them with people. Like we now know who, whose finger was on the, the, the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima and um, the, 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 why the bomb plants in South Carolina and why we're all minimally, minimally, minimally adequately educated. It floats somebody's boat. But you need you need a short course that you can get in and convince people that they need to take a deeper dive. And once I think we get them paying it a little bit more attention, they will realize that some of the things that they have been, have been resistant to do, like participate in elections, that there's that we don't go around telling people vote is going to change your life. But you would be interested in working with the Missing Voter Project. Mr. Fox is going to be helping with that. He I have a few things to say here when I shut up. But the Missing Voter Project, we've been doing since 04, and it, like us, has matured, and it's matured based on what we learn and what we discover about the way the system works. And what we know is that there are enough people that are registered that aren't voting to change the outcome of statewide elections. We also know that there's probably about 70, between 70 and 74% of the 170 seats. It doesn't matter what you do you're not gonna change the outcome of the elections. We also know that most votes in South Carolina don't count, regardless of what we hear from the Democratic Party, regardless of what we hear from the League of Women Voters and all the televisions and all the rock the vote people, every vote counts, they don't. And so we know why they don't, and we, can, we put numbers by it, we're not making it up, this isn't subjective. So the Missing Voter Project, again, is something that is driven from the work we've done that can give you uh, uh, a map of people in your precinct or on your street with their voting record. And I mean, we find that, that people don't want to admit they're not voting, but if you knock on their door and you say, hey, Sally, I live three houses down and you didn't vote last time, and why not? And we're not encouraging them to vote for somebody that's going to win or lose regardless of their voting. We're encouraging them to figure out, well, why is it that citizens don't have any power? Why do we have all these problems? And the reason is we don't have effective citizenship. And the reason we don't have effective citizenship is the people that run the game don't want us to have effective citizenship. And so the painful thing is we're going to have to tell people the truth. And so each one of these projects is predicated on that. With the Democracy 101 is a short course you can take out and show people. Um, and that the Missing Voter Project is a, a street level thing where you go out and knock on doors or make phone calls, we have numbers. The racial profiling project is something that was, is, I think it's a real centerpiece of the work we did in terms of looking at a problem. When we founded the Progressive Network in 96, we, you know, some of us are coming out of the civil rights movement and, and there was little doubt in our minds that racism was this heavy weight that's holding South Carolina back. Well, how do you deal with something 
that, as Majeska said, was bred in the bone and can't be beat out of the flesh. We see that the Confederacy is something that colors the culture and the society and everything else. We decided, well, one way that you can actually quantify it, quantify it and look at it is criminal justice records. That stuff's written down. And so we did, I, I did the work and spent a whole long time, about a year, trying to analyze the impact, the, the, the inequities of uh, the, um, uh, the criminal justice system. And that we came up with a number that was very, very difficult to believe. I was afraid to tell our good friend and leader, Joe Neal, but it actually appears that about 10% of the entire black population in South Carolina is arrested every year. And I mean, there's no industrial nation in the world that has a democracy that even has 0.01. America in general has 4%. We have the 25% of the world's, pop, world's prison population and 5% of the world's population. And so there's a reason that we're so law and order oriented. And that reason is that- Racism, it, capitalism. Capitalism? And racism. Yeah, that people don't have enough to live on in a society that's supposed to be the richest in the world. And that uh, it's pretty clear to somebody that they like steal a loaf of bread and, you know, a, 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 a pack of ham, they may go to jail, but if they can embezzle several billion dollars, they'll probably get uh, a slap on the wrist. So that the, uh, the, the project in terms of racial profiling, we say, well, how can we do, how can we create something that would give people a tool that they could use wherever they live. And I wrote a bill that in, we introduced in 2000. This was after having this kind of classical step of here's the problem, analyze the problem, take the problem to the people, have town hall meetings, publicize it, get it on the radar screen, come up with a solution, write legislation, introduce it, and wait. And the waiting is a real important part for those of us that don't have enough power to make things happen right away. You prepare yourself to take advantage of opportunities. So when something comes along, like Donald Trump and crazy people, that's an opportunity. Are we prepared to take advantage of it? We'll see. But what happened with the racial profiling project, it was to, for all cops to report all stops. And that we would just have them on a monthly basis report the race, gender, age of the people, location of people they stopped and arrest or write a ticket to. And that um, didn't go anywhere. And then in 2006, the federal government said, you're not getting any more highway money unless you pass a race, unless you pass a seatbelt bill, mandatory seatbelt bill. You've got to have it in 06. Mark Sanford, they passed it. The, the Republicans and Democrats got together because they want the billions of dollars in highway money for roads in their own counties. They passed the seatbelt bill. Mark Sanford vetoed it. Because being a good libertarian, he didn't think the government should get between his head and the windshield. And so the Republicans needed some black votes to override the vetoes. And they went to the caucus, and Joe Neal was running the caucus, and they said, well, what do, you, what, do you, what do you want? They said, we want our racial profiling bill. They said, okay. We said, hooray, we thought we won. They attached it to the seatbelt bill and went to conference committee, because you have to always work out, polish the difference between a House version and a Senate version when you attach something to it. And five white guys changed a couple of words in the bill to where not all cops report all stops, but all cops report warning tickets. So that was a disappointment, but you got to realize that we write like 1.8 million warning tickets a year. And that just using the warning tickets is enough to gauge the propensity for racial profiling anywhere in South Carolina. There's 300 plus police agencies that have the power to stop somebody, turn a blue light on, stop somebody out of the car. Let me see some driver's license. And so they have to report once a month, everybody they stop, everybody. Anybody that's got the ability to stop somebody is supposed to turn that county report in. That's been happening since, I think it went online in 2007 at the Department of Public Safety. Go to the Department of Public Safety, click on public contact reports, look up your county, and you can see by a monthly who's stopping whom. If you, you look at that, you'll go, oh my God, young black men should stay off of the University of South Carolina. There's like six, six times to be you know, more likely to arrest it. Mount Pleasant, home of Mark Sanford and, and a lot of Republicans, you're six times more likely to be stopped if you're a black Mount Pleasant than, than a white person. This is organizing fodder for any town anywhere in South Carolina. We've all got at least two police agencies that are reporting. Nobody's monitoring that. We have great ideas, we put them out there and nobody's using the tools. 
But this is something that we wrote a book on, we'll update it, that would be a handbook. But I've actually been with people in the few places that we've done this, and you make an appointment, and you look and you see how they're doing. And if they're doing good, you go and you thank them for it. And you say, well, would you support moving to have all cops report all stops as opposed to just the warning tickets? And the good cops say yes. And most of the good cops are the ones that are in charge. And most of the good cops know that the, the biggest danger is people not trusting and being afraid of them. And that community relationships and transparency is a protective measure for them. So this is, this is something that gives you the entree to go and talk to people that are the cops with something that's constructed that they have to do. And you're checking up on it. And just kind of breaking that difficulty that people have walking up and talking to the chief of police or something, you know, going in and acting like a full-fledged effective citizen. It's something that we have to practice and it takes a little work to do. But the, the, the racial profiling thing has got, like I said, a database of over 300 cops in it that we made them do. Um, the monument project is something that is a, a work in progress that can have a lot more work to do. And one of the things I'm going to say before I turn it over to Dr. Green, because this is something he wants to, to work on, that when we're talking about having workshops on one of these that you want to do, the workshops will announce towards the end of July when they are in August. And I'm going to be doing something that I've needed to do all along, especially since the pandemic happened and people are in Zoom land. I don't get to meet people. I don't get to know people. And I know for a fact that my success as an organizer and activist, part of what's kept me alive and effective is, is meeting people and getting for them to understand what I think and me understand what they think. And that experience is the only way you build trust. You have to have time with people and talk with them. And so I'm missing having time with all of you. And so I'm going to be calling as many people. Everybody that signs up to do something, I'm, I'm going to talk to them. But you will have one of, the, one of our staff, which is me and Becky or Dr. Green, one of our board members or one of our past graduates is actually doing this stuff. Omaris, uh, co-chair of the C4, and he's done some of this stuff. You'll have somebody that is handling the workshop that will be with you with questions and, and doing stuff either in the field or, or you know, a workshop to prepare you to go put on a show at the Kiwanis. And so that that's really important part of this is this beloved community that we want to build. It takes people being the people that we think need to be the people to have the beloved community. We are those people. And it's not easy in this society at all. And I'm, I'm blessed by my vocation and my avocation being the same thing, simply because I got in trouble so young. My grandfather was right. He said, son, you're going to go to prison. You're never going to get a real job. And I was 20 and I was in prison by the time I, I was, I don't think, I think I went to prison before I was 21. And they made an example out of me, but I was very lucky. And we have to kind of have the initiative to figure out what is there more in life between getting up and going to work for somebody else. And that it's hard to find, it's harder in South Carolina than most places to find a job that has that type of meaningful, meaningful existence for you. But how do we do that given, that, given that circumstance that we're in? And I think that's with one-on-one, -on -one, getting to meet people and, and figuring out, well, what is, it, what is it that makes me feel good? And how can I use that to be more of an effective citizen? And I mean, what would I do? Is that I'm, I'm going to shop local? Uh, I'm going to quit you know, eating factory-raised meat and the, you know, burning the rainforest in Brazil to grow cows to bring them here to McDonald's? There are, there's so much that we don't, we don't see because it's so close to us. Um, Fast Food Nation is a book I tried to get everybody to read to be a Majesco School student, but it goes back to the fact that it wasn't until after World War II that corporations took over food. And if you follow that growth of corporations that we've talked about, they've changed and perverted everything we do from education to healthcare to dying even. They're, they're making money on our debt. And so we we, there's things that we as individuals can do to become those people that we need to help us. And that, that's what builds the community. Us doing it, seeing ourselves as the first front in our revolution, and then getting together with people that share those values. And the, the Monument Project is something that, that could be done anywhere 
and there's a, like a growing list of, of monuments. And think of, think of it as not just Confederate monuments. Think of it as monuments to, um, say, Jimmy Burns, who was everything he could be, but he's the one that everybody knows, Brown versus Board instead of Briggs Elliott, because he was a stone cold segregationist and didn't want South Carolina. He was a Supreme Court judge when they, 1954, Roosevelt pulled him off the Supreme Court to manage the war budget. But there's, there's stories behind each one of the heroes of South Carolina. And there's stories behind in a lot of little towns across the state. And what is it that the memorialization is? It's to substantiate the status quo. It's to make heroes out of the people that wrote the laws and did the bills that make us world who we are today. And so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Green, who's going to be much more eloquent in talking about memorialization than I am. But I do want to give some time. But let's see if there's any questions about anything that I've just run through before Dr. Green gets up here. The Democracy 101, Missing Voter Project, Racial Profiling Project, are what I call kind of like boilerplate things that we've done. Do we have really deep research, written laws that are in effect on each of these that empower you to be an effective citizen and sharing this knowledge and, and letting other people have a, a, a way that they can be more effective? Questions, comments, criticism? I just want to call bullshit on here, not uh, speak out loud lately because I invited you over like three days in a row in the house and you didn't <laughs> you were too busy. So I'm just saying. You're very lucky, Mr. <laughs> and he left South Carolina to get his job. And he's come back now. So, but that's that's that, that Russell is a manifestation of the best and brightest that all my growing up, the white people had to leave the state if they were arrested and caused trouble. They would drop the charges if they left the state. If they wanted to get a good job, they left the state. And the black people get in trouble, they like shoot them. And there was exoduses out of the state, the brain drain. And so Russell's back. Thank you very much for returning, Mr. Bannon. All for you. Oh, good. Then I need the help. So hearing no other comments, Dr. Green, talk about memorials. All right, thank you very much. So of course, um, one of the key debates that has arisen in recent years has been over monuments and memorialization, both here in South Carolina and across the country. Um, I wanted to show everyone in the class, before we get into that, uh, if you want to get more information about these various projects, we, we do urge you to take a look um, at the Progressive Network's website. So let me just show you that in case you've not already taken a look. Um, but if you go to the, uh, the SCPN website, you go to scpronet.com, uh, if you go over here to the uh, far right-hand side, ironically enough, um, then you'll see some of these projects we're talking about, like election protection, fair maps, missing voter project, the racial justice project. Uh, in particular, I would like to bring your attention um, to the racial justice project because some of the data they compiled has been incredibly useful in terms of thinking about uh, some of these issues that we talked about in the class this semester. So if you go on the website and look at the racial profiling project, this is what you see, uh, some of the work that they've done over the years. Uh, and in particular, this, this uh, project that they've done has generated a study um, about racial profiling and racial disparities and arrest rates across South Carolina. Um, this is from 2010. It's been updated in 2014. I think they're working with another update. That's the one that came out in 2020. We did the update right. uh, of the previous decade. It takes a few years after a decade wanes before you have new data. It's time to do one for the last decade. And the numbers have not really gotten much better. Right. And you see here, it mentions in the uh, introduction, South Carolina consistently ranks in the top states in incarceration rates, and Blacks account for the majority of convictions. According to the SC Department of Corrections, the white prison population decreased by 4% between 1988 and 1998. During that same time, the Black prison population grew by 60%. Black South Carolinians, in fact, seem to be more likely to be arrested than anyone anywhere in the world. So again, these are some of the ideas and themes that are really important to what the Progressive Network is working on and has been working on for some time. 
But how does this all tie into monuments? Well, I, I think many of us would understand the idea that the kinds of monuments and memorials that the state decides to build, and I emphasize the state, are a reflection of the values of that particular state. And for those of you who have gone to the state house grounds right here in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, you may have noticed that there are a certain set of values being put forth by most of the monuments at the state house grounds. Now, how many folks, either by a show of hands, virtually on Zoom or here in the room, have been to the state house grounds? Okay, quite a few. Okay, all right. Um, and I think it's it's fairly obvious that when you go to the state house grounds, it portrays a certain vision of the history of South Carolina, one that glamorizes and venerates folks like Ben Tillman. Um, like James Burns, like Strom Thurmond, uh, many other individuals who we would not think of as being particularly savory characters in history. But these are the folks who have been memorialized time and again. Of course, in recent years, they have built an African-American monument, which is conveniently the backside of the state house, um, away from all the other monuments. Um, but one of the things that we want to emphasize with the monuments project is we want to give people the tools with which to actually interpret these monuments and not just the standard boilerplate history of when the monuments went up, but also understanding and emphasizing why they were built in the first place. Now, let me give you an example of this. If you go to the website uh, run by Historic Columbia, it's a great website that actually shows you uh, what's on the state house grounds, buildings and landscape on the left side over here, um, you look at who's the, you put his name after, right? You have the John C. Calhoun State Office Building, the Elberry Reset Building, so on and so forth. On the right-hand side, you have people. Um, you have the Ben Tillman Monument, the George Washington Monument, James Burns, so on and so forth. Let's just choose the Ben, Benjamin Ryan Tillman Monument in his full name. Just a now, of course, when you go to the State House grounds, this is one of the first monuments you see. Uh, and this actually goes back to Brett's point about how these are not just Confederate memorials. Actually, many of the memorials on the State House grounds are not about the Confederacy per se, but really more about the legacy of the Confederacy uh, via Jim Crow segregation and the like. You notice this was installed May 1st, 1940, right? This is before the United States enters World War II. Uh, this is, of course, when the movement for human rights in the state is starting to gear up. The year before that, state conference NAACP was formed in South Carolina. But Jessica Simpkins and others of her ilk are already hard at work trying to change the state for the better. So it is no coincidence that a monument like this would go up in 1940, right? Um, but when we when we've done the monuments tour in the past, one of the things that we've often emphasized is understanding why the monuments are there in the first place. Uh, in years past, we've done monuments tours of the State House grounds, and we've often talked about why the monuments are there. And it gets back to this question of people often thinking of history as being written by the victors. Well, in the case of the South, especially, uh, history has not always been written by the victors. Um, in this case, it's been written by folks who want to push a particular agenda. And again, when you think about the relationship between this and say the racial profiling project or uh, the voter, the missing voter project, all of these things are linked together. If you think about what our society emphasizes in terms of who gets monuments and who doesn't, then it's a lot easier to understand why our state is so undemocratic in the first place. Why our state has all these disparities in, say, birth rates, death rates, uh, rates of uh, prison population, et cetera. All of these things tied together. And the Monuments Project is designed to get folks, both within the progressive network and outside of it, to really think deeply and critically about how these individuals and memorials are, are honored on the state house grounds. And I, I think long-term, one of the things I like to do is to expand this to include the entire state, to think about memorials and monuments 
all across South Carolina. Uh, only today, in fact, was the official opening of the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina, right? Which is, I think, a, a counterpoint to a lot of what's being done here. Um, but still, there is a lot of work left to be done. Just recently, and let me just unshare my screen and share it one more time, there has been talk to create some sort of memorial or tribute to Robert Smalls, the famed Civil War hero. Um, there's, there's, they're making May 13th of every year, Robert Smalls Day, uh, but there's also talk in the State House of building an actual memorial to Robert Smalls on the State House grounds. Yes, go ahead. Who's they? Uh, both Republicans and Democrats in the state government. Um, this, this article from the Post and Courier on June 3rd goes into greater detail here, but as you can see in the article, um, what, you, what you're starting to see is that, for example, Governor McMaster on May 15th signed the bill to commemorate Robert Small's day every May 13th. That commemorates the day Smalls reached the, the Union blockade on the, the ship planter. Um, there are efforts to uh, commission a portrait of Robert Smalls in the Senate chamber. In the House, there's an effort to create a statue of Smalls on the State House grounds. It will be more, that explains it. Well, yeah, you know, he's he's um he's Smalls' great grand, great great grandson. Uh, he is also heavily involved in these efforts. But I think even with this, there is an opportunity to think about how much they might leave out about Small's story, right? Because we emphasize the plants and all that, but what about after that? What is he doing during after Reconstruction? Right, go ahead. Well, I was going to mention that, that time shrunk for me when I realized that Robert Smalls was died in Buford. He, he, he had some functionary job after he was in the legislature of, in, in the U.S. Congress. But he died when Majeska was 15. And I spent all this time with Majeska, and she spent time with this guy. It's like, whoa, that just like closed the gap between me and the Civil War. And that's, when you think about that, we seem to be raised at a time when all this was way in the past and things have really changed. Like, excuse me, it was just a minute ago. And this, this country, if you travel, especially to other places in the world where they uh, uh, fond of parts of Europe where they have hotels that were built a thousand years ago. This is frontier land. It's still frontier land. And the type of uh, pushiness that, that brought you manifest destiny and, and the only, you know, and the dead Indians being the only good ones uh, is still, uh, that blood pumps strongly in a lot of MAGA people and people that run this country. But we can lift up the monuments. One, one more point thing about the monuments is that I didn't know uh, until a few years ago that the delegation from South Carolina in the 1840s that went to help fight the Mexicans about taking their land, the driving force of that was they, they could go live there. Mexico invited people to come live in what was New Mexico and Colorado and parts of this huge chunk of the West that Mexico owned. Mexico was an anti-slavery state. So the whole effort, and there's a monument to Travis on, on the grounds at the State House, that effort was to <coughs> throw Mexico out of their own country so they could have slavery. I didn't know. Well, and to that point, one of the things about the Monuments Project that's really important is that there's a whole section of the State House that is devoted to military history of South Carolina. Um, in particular, I took a, a tour, I just walked around the State House grounds a few weeks ago by myself. Uh, and one of the interesting monuments is there is or was, um, that's the wrong one, but there are various weapons on, on the State House grounds, other things. There's actually an artifact that was there from the Spanish American War that was actually taken during World War II and melted down for the war effort. That's actually memorialized on the grounds. But to Brett's point, uh, one of the things about the, the State House that is also really important is that it has things like the Palmetto Regiment Memorial, um, which Brett was kind of referring to there, uh, which is one of the country's few monuments in the Mexican-American War. That's actually a war that we don't really talk a whole lot about, partly because when it was fought, it was actually deeply unpopular in parts of the country. And generations afterward, Americans like Ulysses S. Grant actually argued that the American Civil War 
was God's punishment for the Mexican War in the first place. Wow. Uh, he in his memoirs, he actually writes that. He actually says that the basically the American War against Mexico, where it was fought on false pretenses, where it was fought to take millions of acres of land in part to expand slavery, he argued that the consequence of that was a civil war. And it was God's judgment that we had a civil war that killed so many Americans. Um, a war on false pretenses. That never happened after that, but I digress. Uh, Omari, I know you, your hand's been up in the back. Did you want to say something as well? Yeah, just as a historian, how do you, how do you feel about the monument standing or being taken down? Just where, what's your position? <laughs> 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 well, this is actually a really interesting question, and it does tie back to the Monuments Project in one sense. Uh, one of the objectives of the Monuments Project is to further contextualize and interpret the monuments that are already there in the State House grounds. In South Carolina, there is something called the Heritage Act, which makes it very difficult to take down already standing monuments, mm -hmm. um, unless you get it done through the state legislature and the like. Uh, USC has run into this problem in recent years, trying to rename certain buildings on campus. Now, how do I personally feel as a historian about this? I, I think when it comes to monuments, it, it has to come down to what the local community wants to do. But if you're not, say, going to take down a statue of Ben Tillman, because I honestly, I don't really think the Tillman statue or Tillman himself is worthy of being venerated the way he is via a statue. Um, all the things that he did in the state were, were horrible and were built upon white supremacy. There's no question about that. But if you're not going to take the statues down, at the very least, there should be something there that contextualizes the statue was about when it was built, that sort of thing. I will say, though, when it comes to talking about memorials and monuments, that it is telling. I know that there are some activists who believe that it is maybe a distraction or a waste of time to talk about taking down or contextualizing memorials, it is telling how much vociferous reaction there is to any discussion of taking down monuments or even contextualizing them. Because for many on the conservative right in this country, those monuments also take on a particular importance. Uh, for example, you may recall uh, the protest in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017 where you have all these far-right organizations rallying around a statue of Robert E. Lee in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. um, and that rally results in the death of Heather Heyer, who was uh, an activist in her own right. Uh, it was, for many folks who were on the ground there, a pretty traumatic experience. But these are the kinds of, of debates and arguments about memorials and monuments that we have to have across the country. I think there is a sense amongst those who are not in the historical profession that monuments are just there as neutral value sites. That's not really the case. Uh, every statue to Robert E. Lee or every statue to a Stonewall Jackson or to a Ben Tillman or to a James Burns represents the particular values of the men and women who wanted that statue put up in the first place. Mm -hmm. Or to put it another way, to give you a short answer to your question, I've spent too much time talking about it, a few years ago, I was a part of a discussion at the Columbia Museum of Art downtown here in Columbia about monuments. And it featured a film about monuments in Russia, the former Soviet Union. And there they've had contentious debates about what do you do with monuments from, say, the Soviet era or before that, the imperial era? You know, do you take them down, do you contextualize them, et cetera? And we compare and contrast those debates with those happening in the US, in particular the American South, when it comes to Confederate memorials. And an older woman in the audience asked a question about, well, if you take down Confederate memorials, then aren't you trying to erase history? My response was actually quite simple. If memorials are meant to be used to tell history, then where are the memorials to Black soldiers in the Civil War in South Carolina? You know, we should have, there should be a first volunteer statue at the State House grounds looking right at a Confederate memorial <laughs> and saying that not every South Carolinian was pro-secessionist. I even pointed out there were over 100,000 white men from the South who fought for the Union Army. Where are their memorials? Um, I, I wrote a piece a few years ago arguing that one possible solution to this question may very well be 
to build memorials to other individuals like Majeska Simpkins or to other activists across the South and across the country. Because um, again, if you're going to make the case that monuments are teaching history, which in a way they are, to the public at least, then you have to be more specific about what that history actually means. If you want to have a statue to Ben Tillman up, that's fine. Just talk about what he actually did before and during his, his era and reign as governor and senator from South Carolina. If you're going to have a statue to say Mexican War, then explain why abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and Ralph Waldo Emerson were so opposed to that war. So to answer your question, as a historian, I have to say it's complicated, but I also think that there are some opportunities here for us to explain to the public that memorials and monuments aren't just history, they are history being told via a certain narrative by a certain group of people. But to relate a response to Mr. Fox from the standpoint of a social engineer, um, we, we have a sign that we were gonna make that the, to reinterpret the Tillman monument, that the language we, we, we went on the line, we found out it's gotta be this, all the specs and how many words it has and the type font and all that, we can make one that looks exactly like that. We can make it light enough for you to go stand there and hold it to reinterpret the monument. It was written by Vernon Burton, who you may have had the opportunity to see him. He is the Tillman expert. He wrote uh, like a 28 page introduction to the reprinting of the famous, by, you know, the book on, on Ben Tillman. And so it's unimpeachable in terms of its objectivity. But the thing is, is that it's been there for 80 years. And people, I mean, it's like we've been talking about Tillman people like Robert and I that are in, this, in the trenches here for decades. And people are just like waking up. So we take it down, what happens? Let's reinterpret it and make it stay there with the true message for another 80 years. So it balances out. So I've got kind of a nuanced answer there, Mr. Fox. I think we need to rub it in people's faces so they get it this time. I think we so, should get a contemporary artist or something. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, with May made the African American statue on the State House grounds, then they do that in order to not take the flag down? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, so the question was raised about the African American monument on the State House grounds, and it was placed there in large part to kind of placate people over the issue of the Confederate flags also being on the State House grounds. Uh, for those who may not remember, uh, the Confederate flag flew on top of the Capitol Dome from 1961 until I think 2000 or so. Then it was moved to the front of the State House grounds until of course, 2015, when in the aftermath of the Charleston massacre, it was felt something had to be done. And that was quite literally the least they could have done. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm being very serious because when you think about the folks who were killed in the Charleston massacre, most notably Clement Pickney, he had certain political ideas he believed in that were largely ignored in the aftermath of his assassination. And instead, the state decided we're going to take on the Confederate flag. Uh, sort of a, a sop to people. Um, and I say this only because the year before that, Nikki Haley ran for re-election, she insisted that there was no one who wanted the Confederate flag to be taken down. She said, I haven't heard from any businessmen or others who want the flag taken down. This is just the thing that's been blown way out of proportion. And the following year, they realized, no, there have been folks who want the flag down um, for decades. In fact, tidbit for those of you interested, um, the Confederate flag at State House grounds had been lowered before and taken down briefly. Around April 1968, uh, in the aftermath of Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, it was briefly taken down. Right. And the folks at the State House grounds in the governor's office claimed it was for cleaning purposes. And it's like, the coincidence is not missing anybody. In fact, Benedict College's president at the time said, well, if we take the flag down now for a few days, and I take it down for a few months, a few years, a few decades. We're all doing just fine without it up. This was 1968. Um, but I think, again, the, the thing about the African American monument, it's, it's a beautiful monument, but the placement of it in the back of the state house is, I think, a bit telling. Robert, the, the African American monument was a compromise only between Robert Ford, who was one of the most self-promoting legislators I've ever encountered, and uh, Glenn McConnell, 
who literally dressed up. Glenn McConnell was a state senator who ran the Confederate shop in Charleston, an inveterate Confederate, we call him, Magnolia Sniffer. And so there was, this was like a supposed compromise that brought the, the flag off the dome and onto the lawn, so to speak. But that the part of the deal was that they, they didn't want to have any real people in it when somebody raised Jim Marvizzi. And so the, 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 the monument was, again, a compromise that didn't, the, the compromise designed not to ruffle the feathers that got to make the decision, not the people in general. Heather? Isn't that why we also still, the state celebrates Confederate Memorial Day? It was a compromise to celebrate. Right. 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 Yeah. Now, that is particularly annoying. <laughs> uh, because I only say that because the Confederate Memorial Holiday. It, well, for one thing, I've never understood. I, I understand why we have it in the state, but at the same time, I don't. And this is the same thing about folks who are currently complaining about the renaming of military bases across the country that were once named the Confederate General. So I had a talk with my dad about a week ago about this. And we were talking about, um, I think it was Fort Bragg. Yeah, Fort Bragg. Who's a military man. Yes, who was in the Army himself for 20 years. And he mentioned, you know, the thing about Fort Bragg is named after Braxton Bragg, who was arguably the worst general in the Civil War for either side. Um, but with the, with the Confederate Memorial Day thing, it is kind of an odd holiday. It's like, let's celebrate, A, uh, losing a civil war, <laughs> and B, let's celebrate fighting a war under the worst possible pretenses possible, defending slavery. And C, let's, let's celebrate a holiday in which a lot of people in the South, whether you're African descent or you're someone who moved to the South, may have no connection with the Confederacy whatsoever. And even if you're a white Southerner, this is what something that always frustrates me about Confederate identity politics and the like. And this is my one soapbox rant for the entire semester. <laughs> there are many white Southerners who in their family tree can trace back folks who did not fight for the Confederacy or who fought for the Confederacy and regretted doing so. Many of them desert from the front lines. They don't want to fight for the Confederacy. And yet today in 2023, make it seem as though the white South was this ironclad uh, defense of slavery and defense of states' rights and the like. And that just wasn't the case. The Confederacy had a lot of internal contradictions that in large part led to its defeat in the Civil War. But I digress. <laughs> I also think it's telling that like that's what they picked in opposition to Martin Luther I, like obviously we know that but like I think a lot of people say like we it wasn't a, the war wasn't about slavery it was about state rights but then why would you have it in opposition to a holiday celebrating a civil rights leader I don't know just a hunch I'm guessing the sons and daughters of the confederacy were behind it right oh, also yeah. known as the modern clan like to me it's just saying the quiet part out loud obviously Dr. Ray, before we move on I want to lift up um from Frazier one of our uh, students who I uh, was reading yesterday about his involvement in the uh, International African Monument, and um, and and Herb is now uh, Herb was a, a reporter of some repute from in left South Carolina. He's back now. I want to welcome him to, to to being with us and appreciate. He may have a couple of words to say about his takeaway about the the um, the African American International Monument that he was. Uh, Part of the unfolding of it. And I also want to mention that uh, Herb Fraser put in the chat a book that he co wrote called We Are Charleston, uh, which is about tragedy and triumph of other manuals. This is another important part of the story that we should look up and recognize. Um, and again, uh, Mr. Fraser, did you want to add a few words to our conversation this evening? Well, thank you for the opportunity. I wasn't doing that for uh, the purposes of speaking, I just enjoyed listening. Because uh, that's what journalists do. We listen. Um, but Charleston has been uh, at the center of all of these issues, as we know. And um, and and you're touching on things that uh, have been part of my childhood and part of my professional life for a number of years. Um, all of most of the folks in the room who know uh, or historians know Bernie Powers, I co-wrote. Uh, we Are Charleston with Bernie and Marjorie Wentworth, who at the time <clears throat> was the Poet Laureate of South Carolina. And if you remember, her poem, One River, One Boat, was yanked from the program of 
Nikki Haley's inaugural because they didn't like the tenor of the poem, the subject of the poem. And, and so, you know, we have this long history of, 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 of the power structure in South Carolina, as we know, denying that big elephant in the room. And that is causing so many people uh, to lose benefits. You mentioned $250,000. Uh, is it 250000 or $250 million? It's in Medicare benefits. 1.4 billion or 2.4 billion it's 250,000 people people yeah. Yeah, that's the number okay people who who, who are not getting the health care access that they need uh so i i will be in touch with you guys because i've been taking notes to the for the past what 16 weeks now <laughs> oh. Oh. yeah and i see a lot of stories uh that i'd like to do in the coming uh weeks uh, and to localize them to Charleston and and try to bring this message to the to the, to the readers of the Charleston City Paper. So thank you for this opportunity. Herb, that is precisely why I've, I've worked so hard to get you into this class. I'm going to tell people that Herb said, you can't teach me anything about Black history. I said, Herb, it isn't about Black history. And he's still here 16 weeks later. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, Fred. And we will see. Let me say one you. other thing. We you know, when you were when you were uh, protesting on the campus of the University of South Carolina, I was there, <laughs> and uh, I, I participated in some of those things, but I I didn't get arrested, so I don't know why uh, <laughs> why I didn't get arrested. I'm still scratching my head over that. It's not too late, Herb. It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I, I think that that's just a good way for us to think about the Monuments Project and, and why, again. It's not just about the monuments in the state house grounds. We can kind of expand our ideas of that, but this is a long-term project. And great. Becky, did you want to ask that as well? Yeah, I'm. I'm really so glad um, that you're talking about this, Robert, and um, everybody, because it's one of the things that I think is one of the richest potential projects that we have going. That a lot of the stuff that we have is very database-driven, and not everybody is like data wonks. Um, but I think that this has um, got a lot of potential. Let me show you some that we did. I think we started this in 2018 before right. the pandemic and we had a couple of tours. Let me show you some pictures. And they were led by the Majeska School graduates. And it was a, a harder, I thought it would be a pretty easy kind of um, gig to create because it's a self-contained thing. We were just gonna focus on the state house grounds and it's very rich material just right there, right? Reinterpreting the monuments, why they were there, who these people are, um, and just putting some meat on those very cold bones. And and this, the students were really up for it. It, become, it became just logistically really hard because what they decided to do was to parse each monument that they focused on to a different person so that they did their own research and came up with their own scripts. And they were wonderful, but some of them were very academic and some of them were kind of snarky and it was just kind of all over the map. And I think that what we could focus on is trying to take those things and make them more unified and be, I'm so glad you brought up the historic Columbia stuff, Robert, because they're doing really good work, but it is very surface and it has to be because of their funding and the politics involved. They're just, you know, there's only so much they can do, right? Um, and, and I think that they're doing a really good job, but there is so much ground that we could offer that is not that, right? And as you're suggesting that it doesn't have to just be the state house grounds or even Columbia, um, that it could be, you know, we could focus on different communities or different cities or different whatever. That's, that, that's what's really exciting to me because I think there, it's got a lot of potential that you could really export this to anybody that really is interested in, in working on this. And you can create these inner what we were talking about never quite got to before the pandemic hit was creating these in more interactive tours that people could, um, that we could create an app that people could go on their own and listen to stuff that they, they wouldn't have to be guided by one of us, that they could do some self-guided tours. There could be some things on the websites that they could drill down as deep as they wanted to do. And I just think it's a really, um, let me just show you some photos from that thing. It was really, really kind of cool. I can figure out how to share screen. Just a few. <clears throat> I 
Hey, let's see. That's the late Kevin Gray. So some of these happened during the daytime and some of them were um, like after work. Some of them were on weekends, um, but it was a really, really engaging thing. Some of you may know Vicki Perry and that's Sarah. Dave Matos from the Peace Resource Center. And that's our own amazing Omari Fox in front of the Tillman statue. And that's Marion Sims, who's his own special creature. <laughs> I, it was just really, um, I'm just saying it's a very rich, rich with possibilities. Kurt Shoemate. So I just I just wanted to give you a flavor and I'll turn it back to you. But before I do, Robert, I was just thinking of it while you were talking about monuments and stuff. I'm still fixated on the whole Vietnam thing. And I really do think that we need to create something. And I'm wondering if we could be able to I'm just throwing something out there. If anybody's interested in doing something um, on that, um, get in touch with me because I think we should do something on next to um, the Vietnam Memorial that he that Robert mentioned in that class too. Because um, I think those people that were anti-war deserve just as much, or maybe not just as much, they deserve mention, they deserve commemoration because I think they saved lives. So with that, I will give it back to Robert. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for that, Becky. And that, that's an important point because I think with the Memorial Monuments Project, um, there are other parks in the city that we could look at. For example, there's Memorial Park that's um, over on Hampton Street that I think people just kind of drive by and don't realize it's actually there. Um, if you've ever, I'll just show this really quickly and then we'll move on. But if you've ever driven down Hampton Street and you see this sign, uh, Memorial Park, there are a whole series of monuments there to various conflicts that the U.S. has fought in. There's a Vietnam Memorial there that actually has names of every South Carolinian killed in the conflict by county, which is particularly stunning to look at, especially kind of like Orangeburg in particular. A lot of people in that war. Uh, there are monuments to both world wars. There's a World War I Memorial there that's actually built like a trench. You actually go into the trench like you're in the, the Great War itself. Um, there's a Pearl Harbor Memorial, so on and so forth. There's a Holocaust Memorial that's also really interesting. It has the list of Holocaust survivors who live in the state right now, that kind of thing. Um, so again, there are plenty of ways for us to approach uh, the Monuments Project. And again, as one of the folks in charge of it, I do look forward to hearing from folks who might be interested in signing up. And we can certainly brainstorm some ideas about how to not only bring back the project, but to make it even bigger and better than ever before. Any questions at all? Questions? All right, then. Well, I want to draw out Mr. Fox. Amari does genuine grassroots organizing in communities that we're not plugged into. And Amari, say something that you're doing. Amari is now working uh, in Savannah, and especially because we don't have money to be able to support him. But he's spent time here and has developed what he called a, a barbershop talk that has a whole cadre of people, but it, it's reaching people that we're not reaching. And I wanted Omar to say a few words about that to see if somebody wanted to pitch in and help with some of the stuff you're doing, Omar. And if you want, you can come up to the front and, and talk. Stand come on, let's talk. Um, be loud. So that's how I'm on low energy like probably many of us. So I was a community organizer in North Columbia and um, the ultimate goal of the organizing is that it would be a blue zone. So 
long longevity in life. Um, in that particular community, high violence, uh, minimal supermarkets, maybe two, um, access to healthcare, things like that. So I uh, partnered with two barbershops, one on a corner at Elmwood in North Main. Right I'm like, excuse me, people are saying they get here a lot. Come close to one of my. The little things right there point to that one points it that way. No, you stay there. You're, you're mine. Same <laughs> um, come to that one. Mike, check in Miami. All right, back is clapping. So, um, long story short, because of all the challenges and the zip code, um, every month we invite different kinds of resource providers or just people from the community faith leaders, um, folks like that. I want to shout out one of my colleagues from uh, Mutual Aid, um, Midlands in the Room. Um, it's a, a group, we're still, we're still active, but very, we're a little bit more active at the start of the pandemic. And um, Dr. Billings came out to one of the, Dr. Debbie Billings came out to uh, one of the gatherings. So there's 10 chairs in the middle, each kind of panelist or expert or community person sits in the center everybody fish balls around it each person kind of gives their spiel on what they see challenges or solutions brett made the chair at one of the last ones and then um if we can we try to have some level of cross talk but that mostly happens at the end and then uh, i just try to really funnel all of the people to do the gap filling so we're a progressive network that we do focus on inactive registered voters. <clears throat> and then I'm working with somebody who's trying to tap into that particular base and we can partner. If there's the, the health provider person and they got excess X amount of funding to try to identify people in under, you know, whatever um, research they might be looking for. So long story short is to build a power map of the kind of the key players from the community, whether they're uh, just a grassroots person, neighborhood leader, or former resource provider. And um, the theme is that violence is integral. So it's not always gun violence, but forces that act on your health, forces that act on eviction, um, you know, things of that nature. Um, so it's called cut out the violence. So cut out the violence like haircut, barbershop peace talks. And um, we're planning our next one be sometime in uh, July. Um, I'd like to do a session, maybe a little more dedicated for the Majuska Alumni Association. So I hope you all will form, form that. And um, the goal would just be a story circle of the rising organizers. And then I'll be 50 this year, so I feel like I'm seasoned maybe. So more for those of us who might be a little more seasoned and um, just start sharing these uh, stories. I'm gonna get Dr. Green in the chair. I had Dr. Uh, Shaw, he came to one of the episodes, we call them episodes. So they are really cool. <clears throat> and then everybody plugs everybody into what else they're doing. So basically everybody who came in the chair is looking for organizers or volunteers or what have you in different capacities. So um, yeah, and then I wanna shout out uh, Dr. Green anyway, not on the barbershop, but we had like we did a guest episode for some um, with one of my art groups just talking about the Fort Royal experiment and kind mm -hmm. of the black South Carolina that we don't always talk about. Um that we get to kind of learn in class for the kind of focused it um in a two-hour session. So just things like that, um, all kind of the umbrella under the umbrella of the missing voter project. So um if you sign up for that, you know, I'll give you we we will give ourselves plenty of work to do to advance the work of the justice school and um apply our expertise. So I feel like once you've gone through the course, you know, you get you go to a certain level, but you gotta apply it out into the field. Hard to get him to talk, but when he does it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> He's great for some favor. Great so he, he really is. And I, I think the work that Amari has done and continues to do is really integral to fostering a sense of small D democracy across South Carolina, because you need those kinds of grassroots conversations. I, I think if for no other reason, 
then one of the key lessons of this entire session this semester has been the idea that there are plenty of folks in this state, white and black, who are poor, working class, et cetera, who are just never heard from. They are ignored by the political elite in this state. They are uh, ignored by the elite in this state, period. And they deserve a voice at the table. In fact, they deserve the entire table themselves. But I think initiatives like what Omari is talking about and what we've been doing in the class and what we continue to do through the Progressive Network will all be really important in trying to get these voices not only heard, not only at a seat at the table, but to get these voices some actual genuine political power. And that, at the end of the day, is what this is all about. Okay, so um, any other questions or anything else you wanted to add to that, Brett, at all? No, Dr. Green, I want to call out people on the screen there uh -oh. to make sure they're real people up there. <laughs> and people that we've been seeing their names along the night. Like Miss Sunday, I have no idea who's behind that thing. And, and there's, is that Keith Gray showing his face now? And Keith could talk about, Keith, we had, this is something, yeah, I'm going to put you on the spot. In 2000, the South Carolina Progressive Network individual membership started the, the Progressive Caucus of the Democratic Party. We had one Progressive Caucus that could kick ass and control the floor. What happened, Keith? And what can we do about it? Well, it kind of regenerated after Bernie's campaign. There was a lot of energy and passion. Uh, but as you well know, they they put a you know There's halter and bit in our mouth. Yeah. And uh, so we couldn't endorse candidates. We couldn't. There was an, a lot of us were pushing for a progressive platform that the South Carolina candidates had to at least so outright support some of it, at least some of it. Well, you know, you can tell how far that got with Cunningham and before him, Smith, and before him, Shaheen. So. Well, Keith, I was, I was kind of more interested in focusing on the fact that when there was one progressive caucus, we could get something done. And when we pulled out in 2014, it was after we embarrassed them a number of times by controlling the floor over their wishes. And so they wrote bylaws to create caucuses when we were the only one. Mm -hmm. There's now 15 cockeye that fight amongst themselves and get nothing done. Mm -hmm. And so I'm encouraging you and others that have had the will and the discipline to become <laughs> delegates to the state convention to be pulling together one big caucus. You're all on the same team, pulling on the same end of the rope to get something done. And I'm bringing this up because this is something that I would think it's an odious task, but I watched the Republicans have the discipline to take over the Republican Executive Committee in 1990 something when they then took the, the, 90, the 1992 election resulted in the, the, the Christian coalition taking over the, the government, the governor and the, the, the House, they took the Senate the next election. And it was simply because they had people that had the discipline to go to their precinct meetings, the county convention, to the state convention, become the executive committee and take over the party. I don't want the party. I want the people in the party. But this is something I'm hoping some younger people can get some idea that it's not we're there to save the party. We're there to rescue the people that think it's going to lead them to the promised land. Oh, uh, this is what I've been preaching since 2015, 2016. Thank you, sir, for your time and your effort. It's, it's one, of the, one of the true leading liberals in Lancaster. Okay, so uh, there are more people. Call them out. Make them say something. I, I, I mean, I, <laughs> call them out. I, I'm not going to call their names. <laughs> Who, who's going to say something? Marjorie, you always have word of wisdom. You can find your unmute button. No. Actually, um, before we go to Marjorie, I see Annette's hand is raised. Did you want to say something, Annette? Hey, y'all. I'm an alum of the Majeska Simpkins School. And just two things. When we were talking about the monuments, I remember a few years ago before COVID, Sue Taylor and Titsy did a um, little study group. And she invited the public and we studied the monuments. I think, Brett, you were there for a little bit of it and we talked about it. It was held at the um, 
the um, teachers union off of Bush River. And um, the second thing is, I got an argument with this girl down at the, at the state house. She wanted to take the, to, uh, not Tillman, but Sim statue down. And I said, no, what I am pushing for with our now group, and I'm president of Columbia Now, National Organization for Women, is to have the three mothers that are known to us that Sims experimented on. He also experimented on children, but I want something next to that statue discussing or having the mother's names, they call them the mother of modern gynecology on that statue because he did some experiments on mostly black enslaved women and um, black enslaved children. Well, Nick, you just volunteered for the new monument project. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll make a, we'll make a monument looking sign, and you can take turns in your peeps holding it there by the Sims thing. People, Marion Sims is known as the father of gynecology, cold blooded, cold blooded. He did experiments on women of color with no anesthesia. By the way, Brett, yes, there is another monument to him, but it's not pleasant. It's in Alabama. And it really describes for who he was, a murderer. I, yeah, I think there was one in Washington. I think they dug up and threw away. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Becky, I Brett, see his name was on a, this is Joyce Argo. His name was on a building in Lancaster County, the J. Marion Sims building, and they removed his name a couple of years ago from that building. I'm not sure what the name of the building is now, but there was. Where was, Where that? was it? Where? Yes, ma'am. In Lancaster, South Carolina. Okay. Um, Chief, I see your hand is raised again. Go ahead. Yes, I can respond to that. Uh, there, there was a charitable foundation that was spun off of the sale of our hospital here in Lancaster. And it was called the Marion Sims Foundation. And as things got a little heated about Sims' actual history, uh, about mm, three to four years ago, they changed the name and it's now the Heirs Foundation. They don't have any connection with Sims anymore. And there are some buildings, but there's still, yeah, there's still one thing on the side of a building on across from our historic courthouse that mentions Sims, unfortunately. Right. Really quickly, uh, before we, we go back to others in the audience, I did want to highlight something else. Um, this is another book that Herb Frazier has been working on and just came out, as a matter of fact. Um, and I'm glad he reminded me of this. Um, it's a book called Sleeping with the Ancestors, How I Follow the Footprints of Slavery. He co-wrote this with Joseph McGill. And it's actually this really interesting project about uh, people who will, who will go to what were once slave dwellings across the country and actually sleep in them, talk about what the experience is like. Um, this is actually a wonderful book I've been meaning to get myself. Um, Paul Switching with the Ancestors, again, Herb Frazier co-wrote the book with Joseph McGill. Um, so this is a really, really important way of thinking about moralization. Again, we talked a lot about statues and monuments, but on the flip side, there is thinking about the moralization of everyday life, especially for those who are either left out of the history books or those whose records and those whose experiences are often um, downplayed in history books. So again, sleeping with the ancestors, and I'll put this link in the chat as well. Okay. Um, is there anybody else we should call out this evening? Well, you saw Sabrina Ruth's comments about what's going on in Rock Hill. I think we need to recognize the work that's going on up there. Oh, sure. Uh, Sabrina, did you want to talk a bit more about that? Uh, sure, I am, and I'm sorry, my dog is squeaking. One second. <laughs> squeaking, <He's, laughs> she's got a squeaker. Um, uh, I am part of a group called the Reproductive Rights Coalition, and we've been holding monthly movie showings at a local business in downtown Rock Hill. Um, 
Our first movie was called Ama, and it was about the forced sterilization of indigenous women. Um, and our next one coming up is about a business in Orangeburg, South Carolina, actually, that is forced to fly the Confederate flag. Name the name. What's the name of the business? Oh, it's called The Mercantile. I can, I can. That's the business in Rock Hill, Sabrina, correct? Yes, and I, um, I typed the name of it into the chat, M-E-R-C-A-N-T-I-L-E. -E. There's a Facebook event that I can share in the chat if that would, if anyone's interested with the date and information. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, and the, um, the film that she was referring to about Orangeburg is called Meltdown in Dixie. Um, there is a a shop there where the, the owners of it actually don't want to fly a Confederate flag, but they, they're not really given a choice in the matter. It's, um, yeah, it's the Distal River Creamery and Kitchen. Yes. Um, so again, here is the, I'll just share the website for that, that piece um, as well um, really quickly. But yeah, this is again a reminder of how, I'm glad to hear from folks in the chat because what it's showing this evening is that there is a lot of important work being done all across the state on a grassroots level that often doesn't get the attention it deserves. And I think this is a great time if anyone else in the, in, in, on Zoom land or anyone else in here is trying to do some local initiatives or local projects, please let us know so we can spread the word for that as well. Um, Dr. Green, I was going to say the little, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the little ice cream shop in Orangeburg used to be owned by the late Maurice Bessinger. And he actually uh, gifted the Sons of the Confederate that little piece of plot on his land when he owned that building. And so that is how the flag got there. And um, yeah, and so the little Edisto place is stuck with that flag it can't be taken down and Maurice's son even after his death uh, did some work to try to help them to take the flag down but um, it couldn't be taken down hi everyone I, I'm talking because I'm a native of Orangeburg South Carolina and uh, Serena I live in Rock Hill so we need to get in touch yeah, awesome. That's <laughs> that's so funny. Thank you both. That's the intention of you being here is the okay. network for all actors. Can I just interject while I can? Um, that the I think that as much as we'd like you to work on our projects, that um, there as has been mentioned, there's a lot of good work going on around the state. And so I think what we'd ask you to do is to figure out what really speaks to you, what's yanking your chain, and then try to find an organization that's doing that work and either volunteer or support them financially or however you can. Um, and if nobody's doing that work, then then try to do that yourself if it really means something to do you and, and to you. And we'll try to help you however that we can. But Again, there's like Annette is working with now. She's a, a graduate of the progressive uh, of the Majeska School, and she revived the the Moribund, um, the now chapter. There's a, a there's a resurgence of depth penalty work. That's something that's near to dear to my heart and Brett's as well. Um, that they're they're doing really good work on that. There's environmental work going on there. There's Sierra Club. There are other work going around there there's all kind of like there's a crisis when reproductive rights access so there's ren and planned parenthood and um a lot of people working on that um there's disability rights work going on there's south carolina able sc um there's um and then there's a bunch of union work that's just getting a resurgence and if you want to help russell he's like um maybe you can say something about that russell there's like some immediate needs right now people on the ground that want to learn how to do canvassing or knocking on doors or mobilizing in your community. So, um, Russell, you want to say a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, my name is Russell Bannon. I'm the organizing director for the South Carolina AFL-CIO, which is the State Federation of Labor. Uh, we kick ass for the working class. It's kind of the motto. 
And there is, I think, more organizing going on in South Carolina than I've been aware of in my life. There's, what, 30-something organizers with the SEIU Union of Southern Service Workers currently. And uh, talk louder. I'll just go over here. <coughs> You'll my ear. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and um, you have uh, the electric, electrical workers are organizing at Westinghouse here outside of Columbia and Hopkins. Uh, you have the United Campus Workers, CWA, organizing at University of South Carolina, which is uh, Anson. He's a rank and file and coming on staff here soon, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the tire campaign that the United Steel Workers mm -hmm. is organizing in Chester, South Carolina. And it, it, it's just like it was. You know, they don't kill us anymore, but they kicked our teeth out. And part of what we need to bring to the work, to the struggle for workers' rights is that workers' rights are human rights, but we know people that live in the communities where the unions are fighting for recognition. Mm -hmm. And the unions aren't going to win unless they got friends in the, in the communities. Right. Mm -hmm. And as a prime example, um, the longshoremen are a perfect case study of how you break out of economic violence. In North Charleston, now for generations after the Civil War. 1868. Yeah, they rose up in rebellion and took over the docks and have been in control ever since, and the state has been fighting them ever since. And so if you'll see the flyer on the door, uh, July 12th, the longshoremen from across the East Coast and the Gulf are coming to Columbia, South Carolina. I wanted to call them Mock on the Master, but people thought it was a little too Nat Turner. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, play on the Master. That was good, but uh, we expect uh, it's not going to be a strike, but people are going to be working. That's important. Because we can't legally call a strike. The date again? You, just so everybody knows, there's not a strike actually yeah. happening on the 12th of July. <laughs> July 12th is a rally at the State House that we need people to turn out to, the community people to turn out and support. Because what, what is happening, I'm going to cook it down, is that McMaster is somebody I've been watching for the last 30 years, being doing everything he can to maintain the control of the status quo. And that he is opposed to a union contract at the new Le Leatherman terminal that we have paid for several billion dollars of taxpayer money and federal money, widening the harbor in Charleston ever since they built the Panama Canal to bring the giant ships there with the container crap from China. This contract is a master contract by all the giant ships that bring in the crap from China. They're also bringing it in from other places now, but that the master contract says any new port that doesn't sign the master contract doesn't get the container ships. There are 39 deep water ports in America. The only one, the only government that is opposing this, they the master. And he knows that he can't, it's, it's a show, it's a show. He wants to beat the unions, but he also wants to like- Change labor law. Play to his base. He's trying to change the law. And well, the, the, if, if, they, if they could break, the strongest union in South Carolina. This is a union that's been here for over a hundred and something years. It's created a middle class, a black middle class in Charleston. And the 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 the, the, the Gilliard, the guy they named the, the auditorium after, was mayor for thirty years. He was the ILA's lawyer from like nineteen thirty something to nineteen seventy something. And so they're they're loved by the Charleston community. They're beat up by the Republicans that run the state house because they run on 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 what smoke and mirrors. Union's bad, union's bad. And so there's, there's it's an opportunity for us to show that we see three years smoking marrows. So y'all come. And when the longshoremen do not work, Walmart cannot stop their shelves being done. You can't make their cars or, and so on and so forth. The state economy shuts it up. I want to lift up the, the uh, union of campus workers and stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. This man, Anson, he's actually from South Carolina. Yeah. He's not an outside educator. And he's got a union job. He's going to stay here. Unlike some people, I'm from <laughs> here. Answer, answer, answer's organizing on campuses. Tell us what you're doing. You got young people doing it. Yeah. So we've we've been fighting and winning uh, at the University of South Carolina. Uh, we are a wall-to-wall -wall union. Uh, so anyone okay. a wall-to-wall -wall model. In other words, anyone <laughs> anyone employed by the university. Uh, so we have uh, staff members. We have faculty members and we have a large contingent of student workers, graduate students, um, but we are fighting and winning. We fought for graduate student health insurance. 
and we won our campaign. We fought for a $15 minimum wage, and we got it bumped up twice. Now it's at 14 an hour, so we're getting there, um, and we're going to be fighting uh, a new campaign coming up in the fall, um, also for uh, living wages, uh, fair pay. And uh, what we are looking to do is to build out the United Campus Workers Local uh, to have statewide a statewide presence across the public universities and colleges. So if that is something that you are um, familiar with, if you work or if you know anyone who works at a public university or college uh, in the state of South Carolina, um, yeah, send them our way, United Campus Workers. Um, the website is ucwsc.org. Um, that's ucwsc.org. And yeah, we also- And where does this group meet? Yeah, we meet here in the Growth Center, 1340 Elmwood Avenue, every uh, second Tuesday at 5.30. And uh, we have a calendar on our website. We have a social media as well, if you wanna check out um, the activity that we're doing. But um, yeah, we're, we're not doing it alone either. As Russell said, there's so much labor activity uh, in the state. There you go. That's some beautiful uh, photographs there being displayed from our website. Uh, and if you scroll, you'll also see a uh, number of there articles. That's uh, a big word. <laughs> and then just uh, the Ooh. activity that uh, marching to honor MLK, uh, having uh, organizing retreats, uh, training up the rank and file to, to build out the organization uh, is really crucial. Uh, we are a worker led. Uh, we, when we talk about unions, the union, you know, um, we are the union. The workers are the union. This is our organization. Um, and yeah, we have an expression when we fight, we win. And uh, if we don't fight, then we can't expect to win. <laughs> That's the flip side of that. <laughs> so, so let's do it. Thank you, Anson. And we also plug to the Union of Southern Service Workers. Uh, Russell mentioned the uh, Service Workers Union, SEIU. Um, there's a lot of movement happening uh, in Columbia and Orangeburg uh, and even Charleston with that. But um, Anson's a fellow in their organizing academy. Yes, I'm on loan, loan right now. Um, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yes, um, so uh, keep an eye out for that activity across um, throughout the summer in July as well. Um, for community uh, meetings, mass meetings of workers uh, in Columbia uh, with the service workers. Union. Well, thank you, Anson. For people that are disassociated with the reality that unions actually like make the real start of the state, um, I've been, a, a, the Progressive Network came out of the Grassroots Organizing Workshop, which was a union in 1981. And I have been to union meetings for the last 50 years where the average age was well over 50. And I'm absolutely thrilled that there are meetings in this room right here with young people, the average age is maybe 23. And uh, it's like, wow. It's very, very different, very different organizing thing. So it's a very good thing. Did you have, yeah, IBW's meetings here? You mean know, Southern Service Workers? Oh, we're talking about the young ones. Yeah, they're young. Yeah. <laughs> now, I did see uh, Denise had her hand up earlier. I'm not sure if she's still on the call right now, but while we wait for her to come back, uh, Cecil, I see your hand is raised. Go ahead, please. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, I said at the recent board meeting that I may be, at the, uh, may be the greenest leaf on the activist branch, but I really treasure the opportunities the school's providing me to mature into someone effective in their citizenship and activism. Um, you know, since joining, uh, I've had opportunity to help get the window replaced back in August, uh, take some training for the missing voter project and election protection, um, learning so much during Black History Month with the video offerings, you know, before the classes start up. And then Brett got me started on a new database engine for print media and Kyle, what a nice guy, man. He introduced me to every action. And then Brett gave me some, uh, some little work to do concerning that ILA thing with the Leatherman terminal. Um, you know, what I really 
I'm looking for now. I mean, that is so much. And I feel like I'm, I'm dipping my fingers in a hundred places and something's going to rise to the surface like cream that I am really attracted to. Um, so far, it seems to be that I would really love uh, having some piece of the action with the missing voter project, the racial profiling project, um, but maybe more important really to start building some connections in my own community with like-minded folks. And I know there's some around here. Um, they are members of the network. Um, but I think the biggest part that's come to me through the classes is being exposed to a side of the history that I was never taught. And this has been exciting. And I have to, sometimes it's been pretty damn depressing. And I got a problem. <laughs> I have an appointment with you tomorrow at uh... <laughs> oh, At least, you know, one thing I, I learned recently, which I think is pretty important, um, is that no matter who's on the other side of the political aisle from me, it's important to find that sweet spot with them, to be aware of where we can agree on one issue or another, because that helps open the door for an extended dialogue. We have to talk to the people we're trying to change. Talk one-on-one, -on -one. And, and that doesn't happen, you know, in a classroom, y'all, and and I, that's what I'm learning. That's what y'all are teaching me, and I'm uh, I'm grateful for that learning. And you know, and the school has also kind of shown me that I can't come at people with a with an us versus them attitude, you know. And the school has been giving me a willingness to listen with an open mind. And all of our speakers during classes have demonstrated that. And, you know, and I need to be able to consistently respond with respect. And I saw all of that during the classes and at the recent board meeting, too. You know, they even called me Mr., which I hate. <laughs> you know, I believe that I can, as a member of the network and taking these classes, make a contribution of some maybe a little greater value today than just it, you know was possible a year ago and i really have a lot more uh, that i want to learn from you so thank you for having been there in the past and staying the course today so that i can benefit um i guess I'm really interested at this point. I mentioned a couple of things. Um, what Ms. Roof talked about with her documentary showings, that has immense appeal for me. Uh, you know, my wife's a theater major and and I think setting up some, some local viewings to engender conversation would be an awesome, awesome thing. Um, so I wanna thank you. I wanna put, put, put a pin in it for you to put the committees that you want to be on in the chat and get other people to do the same thing because we could save the chat and get the right people to get in touch with you. Sure. And I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. You know, I'm also really interested in supporting efforts to create publications, especially the ones that would go in our public schools and, and uh, school libraries or public libraries generally. Um, and with whatever spare time I might muster, I'd like to start looking at the monuments here in Anderson County uh, that are really begging for interpretation. And so, because I'm, I just think I need to thank Dr. Green, Brett, Becky, Mr. Frazier, Mr. Gray, Mr. Durfner, all the speakers, every student for everything that you've all been giving, you know, when I was uh, working at Columbia, uh, the Capitol newsstands, you know, we carried the point and all these progressive things. It was a great place to begin learning. Um, and I spent a lot of money on books there. 
well, now I've, I've been spending the money I get on books, which is a nice change. Um, so I have a list from tonight to start working on too. Um, finally, I'm really, really looking forward to being with all of you at graduation. Uh, but I'm massively grateful that technology kind of helps us connect with each other, you know, to help us all work to achieve some change. Um, sleeping with the ancestors, Herb, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you, Susan. You're welcome. I, I want to call out uh, Kathleen Campy, who's uh, one of the numerous unsung heroes, certainly, of um, a, a woman in Greenville. They're, they're rare uh, that Kathleen uh, stepped up and served time in the legislature and continues to be a voice for progress and stuck us out. Kathleen, if you're there, you can it, you can say a few words. If you, there she is. You want to say something? I, I, I've mainly been listening. I, I was um, there in the state house when um, Brett was um, organizing the Progressive Network. I was the victim of the Christian Coalition. No. Um, Liz Patterson and I all got voted out of office at the same time. Um, Bob Inglis went around um, campaigning. Now, of course, he's seen the light on climate change, but he didn't at the time. Mainly involved in environmental issues. And do want to share one thought I had when we were talking about memorials. Cesar Chavez has always been one of my heroes, and I grew up um, boycotting lettuce and grapes in, in Arizona for years in support of the farm workers. Um, and we were hiking in a state park in California, and I was very pleased to find some um, acknowledgement of Cesar Chavez's work in, in Southern California in that state park. However, all the plaques and information were at the back of a rather remote parking lot in the park. <laughs> so position is important. The other thought I had on Memorial that I want to share is that the, um, and I don't know if it was intentional or not, but um, there are very few memorials to women. And in the city of Greenville, what um, women have started to do is put their money, um, often um, surviving their husbands, and taking that money and um, memorializing their work. Um, and we have many parks and, and monuments now in Greenville to women, but they were initiated by women and funded by women. Um, and it is hard for a city or local government to turn down an impressive statue or park or fountain or something if, if there's money associated with it. So just passing that on. Keep up the good work, Brett. I did also want to say, and you had said several times during this program how reaching a certain age and backing out and, and there was no age limit to taking this course, but maybe there should have been, because I'm like you, trying to find the replacement for the causes I believe in, and, and glad to see that young people are stepping up, at least in the area of union organizing, but environmental organizations, we're all old, and um, it, it, we, you know, it is, hard to find the, the um, replacement for our causes. And yet I would like to step back a little bit. So that's it. Thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Kathleen. If, if you will let us know the monuments there, I think we can like, you know, do some promotional work to try and raise some younger people to pick up the torch from you. I don't want to quit. I just want somebody that's faster than I am to take the torch from me. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's Xanthi Norris or um, uh, Lillian Block Proming amongst those people you spoke of? Well, you know, and of course, those are old timers too, you know? And, and no, I'm actually talking, um, 
you know, Greenville has beautiful parks um, and there are names of the parks now, little pocket parks and, and features in that park that are associated with women, but they tend to be, um, I, I would say, old Greenville white women. Oh, okay. Okay, well, we, yeah. We need to no. fix that. But that's what I'm saying. You almost have to take the initiative to find a place. And quite frankly, the state house grounds are, are interesting, but more people hang out in parks. And maybe that's where we should put some of um, the monuments to people in history that we want people to see when they're walking their dog or, or you know, um, jogging. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate all that you've done. There is a question in the chat. Um, it's from Annette. It says, uh, will the Harriet Tubman Center that Kevin started be revived? And Brett, do you know anything about that? Or um, Kevin Spirit lives. I don't know if the Harriet Tubman Center does, but there happens to be uh, a Kevin birthday party that's coming Saturday. Uh, we'll put the challenge to his children. And um, it, the, what Kevin got in terms of his legacy project that he worked for five or six years to get this cafe going that's on the edge of the white community and across the street from the HBCUs, Alan and Benedict, with the idea of bringing things together. And Kevin, unfortunately, uh, and very untimely and with no fanfare or announcement, fell over and died. Uh, and that, but we believe, I believe very clearly that he got the rock to the tipping point and that place is going to exist. And right behind that, um, Francis Close has put up money to buy a big building that is now becoming, I think they're naming it Ernest after Ernest, Ernest Finney. Finney Art Center, yeah. Ernest Finney, you know the name? Or actually, Marjorie, I think you wanted to mention something about it too. Go ahead, uh, unmute yourself, please. Hey, unfortunately, you're still muted right now, Marjorie. Go ahead and unmute yourself. How's that? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I'm on that board with and Nikki Finney is our chair and 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 Kevin and 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 Ms. Close uh have been a part of the leadership of the development of this cultural artist center. We've had a few activities, but we're still in the developmental stage. But we're gonna be big deal. Yeah, it is. And we are, and again, on Saturday, of course, we'll be celebrating his birthday. And, um, but also it, 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 along with his family, of course. Yeah, that's 11 to, I believe, four at that place, right behind the railroad barbecue at the corner of Hampton and Harden. And so the question was the Harriet Tubman thing going forward. Kevin had a lot of good ideas. And they're all there, and we'll see which ones go forward. But um, this one has gone forward. But well, that's not the Harriet Tubman. This is the Nick, the Ernest Finney. Finney, Cultural. exactly. And and Kevin's um, railroad barbecue is right in front of that. Mm -hmm. It has a, an amazing uh, amount of photographs and posters and whatnot. Many of many of which we printed uh, when we were working with Kevin over the fifty years we had a relationship. We've got a little more time, and I want to see if I can make Dan Lackey say something. Dan is a reclusive person who's kind of given up on humanity, and the fact that he actually stayed with it and has come to some of our, a number of our um, programs has given me hope for humanity. And so, Dan, I don't know if you're still out there, but I really appreciate you being there. Dan is another person who was a reporter in South Carolina that disappeared for a long time and then came back. <laughs> There he is. Yes, uh, this is a slightly younger version of myself. Um, let me see here. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, Progressive Network for just existing, and I'm uh, in my septuagenarian years uh, looking for a cause, and uh, it's been very gratifying uh, to be able to sit in on most of these meetings. Um, I was always afraid. I hope you didn't call on me the other night. Uh, I've listened to most of these talks. Uh, I've been occupied all day, and I, I found out that at age, even though I'm still healthy, 
that I have to take a nap sometime during the day. Uh, when I taught for 30 years, I never got angry at students who fell asleep because mm -hmm. I knew that's a poignant condition. You, you don't want to. I only fell asleep during one meeting because I, I attended all the classes mostly in a horizontal position listening to my laptop. If I, the one time I fell asleep, uh, Dr. Green, it was not for your being boring, but the fact that I was so intensely hanging on your every word, I was, I had one point focus, which helped me go to sleep. So uh, this has been tremendously uh, uh, inspiring, even by Zoom. Uh, and I'm glad to have been able to attend um, the uh, MLK movie, uh, the documentary, uh, the only time I've been at the uh, at the Grow Center, except for the one time I met, uh, I was very happy to meet Brett personally. Uh, just a hello to my old colleague, uh, Herb Frazier. I don't know if you remember me from the state. I was there one year, but hello. And thank you very much for calling on me. But Dan, I expect to see you this coming Saturday for the graduation from four o'clock. We're gonna have dinner afterwards. You're close enough to walk, so you have no excuse. Herb has to drive up from Columbia, from Charleston. So I want to just put a bug in everybody's ear that's still with us. That we need we need to like pressure flesh. Please bring it here on Saturday. And we've got a deal with a, a hotel right around the corner for $109 a night. Nice place. Fairfield Inn and Suites. And so please come out and see you. I'll try to make it. All right, again, and that's uh, the graduation ceremony this Saturday, July 1st, uh, starting at four o'clock, and dinner will start after that around six or so. Um, of course, there are in-person in options for graduation, but also Zoom, but we really appreciate it. If you can make it down for graduation in person, uh, please do so. And um, I think I'll just finish up class with this. Um, this has been my, I think, fifth year now doing the Majestic Simpkin School of Human Rights. And every year I've had the chance to not only teach people, but to learn from the students as well. And I think what I've learned this particular semester is that there are a lot of people in this state doing some great and exemplary work in the cause of social justice and human rights. And tonight we heard some snippets of that, but we wanna encourage folks, uh, if you've not already done so, to let us know which project you'd like to be uh, interested in or get involved in, or if you have your own ideas, please let us know. Um, as you've learned this semester, there is a lot of work for each and every one of us to do. And I think we've seen in the news this year, in the politics of the last few years, living in the age of, of COVID, war in Europe, climate change, uh, racial justice at home and abroad, there is a lot of work for all of us to do. The good news is that I think each and every one of us has the tools necessary to do that work. So I want to thank all of you for being students in the Majestica Simpkin School of Human Rights this year and for teaching me what it means to be a true citizen of South Carolina, not just living here, but actually making a difference here too. Thank you. Thank you, Robert Drake. That's it, kids. <laughs> all right. And again, graduation this Saturday, July 1st, 4 through 6 p.m. All right. So hopefully we'll see you there. Bye, her. Bye, guys and girls. Marjorie. Thanks, lovely. everybody. You've been great. Thank you. It ain't over. It ain't over. It's just beginning. <laughs> well done.